I'm thrilled that so many of you have joined me on this webinar. It is indeed a privilege for me to be your guide, to be your partner, and your advocate in your journey back to the extraordinary health you so richly deserve. The chilling reality may very well be that 8 out of 10 of us are suffering from one or more microscopic vampires or even larger critters. You know, in 1978, a nationwide survey conducted by the CDC found that one in seven of us had one or more parasites. Nearly 30 years later, a secondary survey found that one in three were infected. So parasites are definitely on the rise, and they are not only an inconvenient truth, but as far as I'm concerned, they're one of the most unrecognized and neglected diseases of our time. The truth is that any type of testing is not always accurate. More about this later. So it's impossible to use stool testing as the gold standard for assessing true infection. In a study of diagnostic labs in our country, researchers found that 1 in 10 correctly identified cases of amoebic dysentery, a parasitic disease that can actually kill you. So here are the astounding facts. Over 130 different hidden invaders can account for over 385 various diseases. Their symptoms go way beyond the gastrointestinal tract. Parasites truly may be the underlying cause of some of the most prevalent, insidious, and mysterious disorders of our time, like leaky gut syndrome, such a popular diagnosis today as well as autoimmune problems, weight gain or weight loss, and viral conditions. And these are just a few of these conditions. More specifically, parasites and worms are the great masqueraders. They impersonate a multitude of more recognizable diseases. Chronic fatigue and candida can actually be a case of chronic giardia. Ulcerative colitis may be, in truth, a case of undiagnosed amoeba. Migraine headaches and depression may in fact be toxoplasmosis because in one study, toxo was found in nearly 50% of migraine sufferers. And it's believed that toxoplasmosis may stimulate the trigeminal nerve controlling facial and head pain. Other symptoms of toxoplasmosis include all those mysterious body aches, fever that comes and goes, as well as fatigue so much of what we now consider to be fibromyalgia. Asthma has been related to a roundworm going through the lungs, and even type 1 diabetes can have a parasite connection, tapeworm to be exact. Now, I believe that cases of ADD and ADHD can clear when pinworms are removed. Food and environmental allergies disappear when worms are eliminated. I've seen rashes and boils clear up when people do a comprehensive targeted colon cleanse that I'll be discussing shortly. I've personally experienced how brain fog and hypoglycemia are lifted when threadworms or roundworms are cleared from the system. And we now know that some forms of arthritis can be connected to amoeba, while seizures can be triggered by a poor tapeworm infection. Quite frankly, my friends, the list goes on and on and can include constipation, diarrhea, gas and bloating, infecto-obesity, persistent flu-like symptoms, anemia, secondary gluten and casein and lactose intolerance, Crohn's disease, sleep disturbances, and even an enlarged liver or spleen. Just remember one thing. Above all else, as my original 106-year-old mentor once taught me many decades ago, parasites are the most immunosuppressive agent known to man. They place a major burden on the immune system, and they're especially toxic to the liver. So by eliminating parasites, first and foremost, your body can then reduce its toxic load, and your system can more efficiently clear pathogenic bacteria, heavy metals, fungus, and mold. So my question to you is then, what is a parasite? It's an internal hitchhiker, which is zapping your energy, eating your food, blocking your organs, and creating a whole host of inflammatory responses. The word parasite itself comes from the Greek words para, 
which means beside, and cetos meaning food. It is a creature which lives on or in another organism from which it obtains nourishment. So where are these critters coming from? I've synthesized a series of some of the most prevalent factors that I believe are really causative in this very, very secretive epidemic. So first and foremost, we need to take a look at water. Water is one of the most frequent ways that people can become infected with a variety of parasites, but the most common are cryptosporidium, which is considered the leading cause of waterborne illness in our country today, as well as giardia, which is another parasite contaminant, very specifically found in fresh water. Now the problem with these particular contaminants is that bacteria Unlike bacteria, neither Giardia nor Cryptosporidium is killed by chlorination. You either have to boil your water or kill it, kill these, these particular critters with sufficient amount of iodine or use a very specific ceramic type filter which can filter out many of these issues. Then we also have international travel. So many of us in this day and age are traveling to very exotic locales. And Giardia, once upon a time, was perhaps the most frequent infection that people brought home, particularly if they had been to certain areas of Russia, where the organism can be found even in the tap water of some big cities. The most dangerous parasite that Americans abroad are very likely to be exposed to, of course, is malaria. And over 2 million deaths a year in 100 countries are caused by malaria. So many geographic areas have their own special hazards. I have seen clients come home from China with a case of roundworms. I have seen people that have been to the Middle East who have become contaminated with freshwater blood flukes that have given them schistosomiasis. So whenever you find that you have you feel that you have been contaminated or infected with a parasite, it's so very important to have that checked out first and foremost because if not, these things can become well embedded in your system and are much more hard to diagnose. Then we have the issue of raw and undercooked foods. This is a primary issue when you take a look at some of our unwashed fruits and vegetables as well as undercooked meats or fish or pork, which we know can be the carrier of pork tapeworm. This particular issue to me is very important when you consider how, how very popular certain types of cuisine has become. And that specifically is going to be targeting your sushi, your sashimi, the steak tartar, and even pickled herring. Many individuals become very sick when you do not cook fish properly, and there are certain kinds of worms, including tapeworm as well as other types of worms, which can create major stomach ulcers and appendicitis. So fish that are particularly known to be prone to carry all types of infective parasites include salmon, rockfish, and as well as Atlantic haddock. Now, when we take a look at daycare centers, it's important for parents to understand that Giardia can be rampant in many of our daycare centers. There were studies done years ago that found 25% of many daycare centers had children that were infected with a Giardia infection. That's why it's so very important that all counters, countertops, as well as any areas where the children are playing are sufficiently sanitized. And then we have our beloved pets, and unfortunately there are over 240 infectious diseases that humans can catch from animals. 65 of those are transmitted by our beloved dogs and 39 by cats. So you have to understand that if our population is becoming more immunosuppressed, so are our pets. They're becoming sicker the way the American population perhaps is as well. Individuals that have served overseas can oftentimes bring back very exotic parasites, as we know from our Vietnam vets and those that have been in the Gulf War. Last but not least would be our imported foods where we have found problems with certain types of berries as well as different types of fruits and vegetables as well, where some of the sanitation of what is growing on in the field has not been up to par. So that is why it is so important 
when people are traveling or when people are exposed to any of these elements, that there are certain parasitic properties that you take in your vitamins and minerals that can be protective against some of these elements. And that's why it's also very important that when people are traveling, they can start taking some of the parasite-killing herbs and botanicals that are very targeted to the small as well as the larger critters. Now, when it comes to the most common invaders, I think you'll find this aspect exceedingly interesting because what we now know is that some of those microscopic invaders can be the ones that are most toxic and are creating the most symptomatic problems for many individuals. Those particular common invaders include the one-celled microscopic or vampire organisms. That's what I like to say. They include blastocystis, cryptosporidium, as well as cyclospora, amoeba, and giardia. When it comes to your nematodes, we're talking about roundworms, pinworms, and hookworms. The cestodes are your tapeworms, your beef, your pork, your fish. And last but not least are the flukes, which have become increasingly common in this country for some unknown reason, where we're finding an enormous amount of lung flukes, we're finding intestinal flukes, as well as liver flukes, believe it or not, particularly in certain areas of the Northwest. Now, blastocystis, of all of these most common invaders, happens to be the particular kind of organism which is now regarded as a very pathogenic one and is the most common that is found in many laboratory tests. It was once thought to be absolutely harmless, but it is now known to cause quite a lot of diarrhea, nausea, sinusitis, abdominal cramps, as well as pain. One of the best ways to get rid of blastocystis, because we used to think it was a fungal type organism, is with some of the botanicals that can target fungus. One of the best ones that I know of is a derivative of the castor bean oil, which is known as undequinoic acid. When it comes to some of the other toxic protozoa, I believe the cryptosporidium may take the number one place in terms of these vampires in your system. The cryptosporidium is transmitted by groundwater, domestic animals, and the fecal oral route. And it uh, also is pretty prevalent in daycare centers along with Giardia. I have seen individuals who have been sick for the rest of their lives after drinking contaminated water with this crypto. It oftentimes evidences as bloody diarrhea, and if it's not taken care of quickly, it can lead to all kinds of ulcerative colitis. I know of many instances where individuals may have been exposed to cryptosporidium just by a little drink in, some, in, in a camping experience of some contaminated groundwater. And these individuals have had problems for the rest of their lives. One individual that I know of very, very intimately just had to have his entire colon removed. So these are no, no laughing matters. Now amoeba is a very interesting parasite because it is the one that is usually not recognized in this country unless you do a specific type of test which can test for the antigen in the saliva. The problem with amoeba is it can oftentimes be confused with other types of colitis, but I believe that most all types of problems in the colon are truly due to an amoebic problem, but they're very, very difficult to analyze and to di dissect in this day and age. Now, when it comes to Giardia, we're talking about beaver fever. We're talking about contaminated city tap water, clear mountain streams, and well waters, which are frequently the source of infection, as are the droppings of your pet dogs, your cats, and even your parakeets. Many individuals can become sick from their beloved animals, and the symptoms include explosive diarrhea, nausea, bloating, abdominal cramps, weight loss, and a very fatty stool. Long-term infection, and this to me is very interesting, can produce many nutritional deficiencies as well as a type of secondary gluten intolerance. So we're seeing such an uptick in problems with gluten. I have a feeling if we were able to test all of these individuals and do a proper antigen test, we would find that many of them may be suffering, in fact, from Giardia. 
Now, when it comes to the worms, we're looking at these bigger creatures, your roundworms, your pinworms, and your hookworms, which are very common in many different areas of the world. It's felt that the Ascaris roundworm is probably the most common intestinal parasite throughout the world, with perhaps a billion individuals infected. Now, people become infected by eggs and soil or food. The worm lives in the intestines, but it can travel through the body, to the heart, to the liver, and through the lungs. So it's felt that many cases of unresolved asthma may, in fact, be created from the traveling roundworm or larva. When it comes to nematodes, we would have to consider the lowly pinworm, which is probably the most frequently found American parasitic worm, particularly in children. And humans can pass it on to one another, but it can also be picked up from contaminated food or water or house dust. Now, the female pinworm moves outside the host's rear end in order to lay eggs and creates a great deal of itchiness. Children, after their fingers have scratched this type of itch, can pass the eggs on to other children or adults or even to food so that they can become reinfected through the mouth. When there is a child that has pinworm, all of your sheets, your toilet seats, and your bathtubs can be probable sites of infection. Once upon a time, there was a childhood pediatrician. It was Dr. Leon Litter from West Hartford, Connecticut, my hometown, who documented far more serious problems associated with infection, which include hyperactivity, vision problems, even epilepsy caused by the lowly, lowly pinworm. We're finding a great deal of tapeworm in this day and age because so many individuals are eating uncooked beef. They're having problems with pork as well as fish tapeworm. We just found an individual, in fact, that had the pork tapeworm. She'd been suffering from a great deal of undiagnosed or I should say unresolved seizures. And we found her pork tapeworm not in the stool but in the antigen that we, that we locate through the saliva. So beef and pork and fish tapeworm are alive and well because so many of us are eating foods that perhaps are microwaved, not cooked thoroughly, and we need to be able to understand how not cooking our foods thoroughly is probably one of the most important ways that these things are gaining entrance into our systems. Now the flukes to me is one of the most interesting areas because when it comes to the flukes, we're finding that lung flukes are now becoming a little bit more prevalent. People that have all kinds of unresolved issues with their liver may in fact be housing liver flukes and then we have the intestinal flukes. Luckily, many of these flukes as well as your tapeworms and your roundworms and even the protozoa can be cleared from the system without the use of toxic drugs, but very natural, time-tested remedies that I'll be presenting to you towards the end of this webinar. Inside this hidden epidemic is all the important elements to know about testing. And this is what I find to be very unusual in this day and age. You know, when I came to the whole concept of parasites, which was very, very new to me, I found that testing is perhaps not the most accurate way of analyzing whether or not one has a parasite. So I've always found that trying to, I've always wanted to find the best test, testing labs in the country and they have become far and far between or few and far between because so many of the old timers that really have lived through many of our world wars and have seen everything on the battlefield that our men came back with are no longer with us. So the reality today to understand is that the majority of parasites, they're living in the small intestine. They're also found in the blood and the lymph. And then last but not least, they could be found in the colon. So accurate testing for those that are doing a stool sample can be a problem especially to analyze or to detect the parasites that are living in the small intestine or are residing in various organs and they can live in the brain, they can live in the eyes, they can live in your liver. 
So those that do reside in the colon may not be coming out with a particular type of stool sample because they are living, in fact, in the bowel walls and they're not coming out in a random stool sample. So that is why so many of you are not being tested adequately because we don't have a 100% uh, foolproof method of testing. I learned many years ago from one of my parasite teachers who is an army parasitologist whose name was Lucretia Dowell, Dr. Lucretia Dowell, and she was a laboratory officer during World War II. What she told me was that if there was a stool sample taken during the initial phase of somebody's symptoms, the parasite was usually found. But if you've been chronically ill, then parasites are not always found from a random stool sample. So she, in fact, way back then, many, many years ago, pioneered a specific purging method, and she used fleet phosphosoda on an empty stomach, which was supposed to induce and did, in fact, a series of bowel movements. Dr. Dowell taught me that parasites rarely appeared before the fourth evacuation, and sometimes it took up to 12 bowel movements that were required to yield a positive identification. Unfortunately, today, most labs forego the entire purge stool sample because there's so many individuals with sensitive colons, small bowel obstructions, and there are greater concerns regarding the high sodium content of the flea phosphosoda. And now that particular purging element has been removed and recalled from the market because of the possibility of kidney damage. So we are now on the lookout for the most appropriate type of purging solution that people can use so that we can get a better identification, particularly of some of the more exotic worms or flukes that may be residing in the system. The only one test that I have felt is the most accurate after studying with parasitologists for the past 25 to 30 years is an expanded GI panel. And it is one that can detect parasites and find possible causes for numerous amounts of digestive problems, including that secondary or primary gluten intolerance. It will find the possible causes for your hyperactivity, for leaky gut, which I do not believe just exists on its own, for the inflammatory bowel disease, chronic fatigue, constipation, and fibromyalgia, which again, I believe are all connected to one or more intestinal invaders. The expanded GI panel specifically will also test for H. pylori, C. difficile, candida, and various types of fungi. Protozoa in worms, specifically Giardia, the blastocystis, which is oh so common, as well as Toxoplasma, tapeworm, and roundworm are other of the most important protozoa in worms that are detected. Specific allergies to cow's milk, eggs, and soy, and gluten are also assessed, as well as a variety of intestinal function markers like GI immunity, pancreatic enzyme output, inflammatory responses, as well as pH. So in the privacy of your own home, there are about three stool samples and two saliva samples which are collected and then sent to the laboratory. The results go directly to my office, after which you receive a personalized letter of recommendation and test results, which could include natural antiparasitic herbal formulas or nutritional supplements or even a variety of diet and lifestyle changes. You can expect to receive your results from this test from about two to three weeks after the lab receives your sample. What I find so incredibly helpful with this particular test, which we do through the Diagnostic Text Lab in Washington State, is that the lab tests for the antigens in the saliva, and this is where we have seen so many exotic critters that have not shown up in the stool. We have found amoeba in the past week, as well as the pork tapeworm, which is so very difficult to diagnose. Now, for those of you that do not want to do 
the stool sample and it may not show every single thing the way we would hope it would, there is also another option which is simply to do the colon cleansing kit. And the colon cleansing kit is a 30-day parasite cleansing protocol. And that 30-day parasite cleansing protocol is very helpful for removing the basic worms or protozoa from the system. And then you have a bit of a resting period. So from days 1 to 15, you'll take both the liquid and a pill substance. You will then rest for five days. And then after which, from the, in terms of the next two weeks, you'll continue to take these antiparasitic herbs and botanicals and enzymes, as well as your probiotic. Now, it is optional at that point to take it is optional at that point to take a product which is very specific for the eggs and larvae, which is known as Zymex 2. You see, you're going to be targeting with these particular products that I helped develop many years ago. You're going to be targeting both the protozoa as well as the larger critters. The parakeet is designed specifically for both, but it's more targeted for the protozoa. The Verma Plus is more targeted towards the flukes as well as the tapeworm and your other types of nematodes. So again, for the first two weeks, you take these two to three times a day between meals before bed. You will rest for five days. You will then, for the next two weeks, continue with the parakeet, your Verma Plus, and a powdered probiotic, which is just very much easier on the system. And then you can also include the Zymex 2, which is designed to get rid of any of the parasite eggs that could be under some of the mucosal membrane that is in your system. They like to live. The eggs live under a, a, a window mucus. This can also kill off some of the larvae. Many individuals need to do this basic 30-day parasite cleansing protocol for up to three months. It's amazing the kind of results people get because years ago they used to send me their results in these little jars. I can tell you very specifically that it works well with everybody, but for those of you that may have had a more chronic condition, you may have to work a little longer and a little harder. I'm also a big believer that when it comes to many of these supplements, that it's very important that you start the program and then continue perhaps once or twice a month once you complete the whole series and course of treatments right around the full moon. And as many of you know who have heard me on various summits, I know from working with this arena for so many years that we get a better result when we target the four days before, during, and after the full moon in terms of parasite activity and parasite removal. So while it's important to do your parasite cleansing protocol for one month or two months, as the case may be, you may want to follow up at least four days out of the month to make sure that you have not picked up anything along the way. And again, the parakeet assists in elimination of intestinal waste and microorganisms. The Verma Plus, because of some of the ingredients, helps to release the larger parasites from the system. And then you have the Flora Key, which is so important because it contains at least 10 billion beneficial bacteria per serving to strengthen your good bacteria in your gut. I'm not a believer in high levels of probiotics, which I feel is exceedingly important, but not during the initial two weeks of the parasite cleanse. I have worked for years with parasitologists, many of them who have worked with the World Health Organization, who strongly believe that you can feed some of the parasites by feeding them good bacteria, as well as high levels of antioxidants, which I know may be an issue with some individuals. Now, the key ingredients in your parakeet formula include a proprietary blend of a pH balance, cranberry, grapefruit seed extract, pomegranate, peppermint, and wormwood. 
the ingredients in the Verma Plus designed to eliminate those larger critters include black walnut hulls, wormwood centauri, so important to help release the hooks and suckers from intestinal walls according to Native American herbal law. Lore. And then you've got male fern, which is important for removing larger microorganisms, very specifically good for tapeworms. The Verma Plus contains orange peel, which I find very healing for the mucosal membranes, particularly in the esophageal area. And then, of course, cloves, which helps to improve digestion and circulation and may also be important in terms of its ability to remove the eggs. And the flora key is necessarily a lower level beneficial bacteria with only 10 billion CFUs because we do not want to be feeding the parasites during this whole process. And now when it comes to what you should be deleting and eating, I think there are very special protocols in terms of your food. So during your cleanse, we're going to want you to be eating healthy organic food that is, of course, as GMO-free as possible. And in this regard, we've got your cooked veggies, your soups, your bone broth, your organic grass-fed protein. Foods that are high in zinc and high in vitamin A are very important, as well as making sure that you're using a great deal of these wonderful killer spices as much as possible. And those are spices that are specifically designed to help with parasite cleansing. So if you can tolerate garlic, that's a wonderful killer spice, as well as onions, cayenne, very specifically, very anti-parasitic if nightshades are not a problem, as well as thyme, fennel, and cloves. Pumpkin seeds, extremely helpful as one of your go-to snacks, as well as two to three cups of mugwort tea. It's one of my favorite go-to remedies to prevent and also detoxify the system from parasites. During the cleanse itself, there are things you need to delete. And that is basically anything with sugar, because parasites, they're, they're, they love sugar. They love lactose. Uh, we tell you to avoid beans, nuts, and seeds, unless, of course, they're sprouted and they're fermented, as many of you are now doing, because these are typically harder on the digestion. Ice, cold, or raw foods can oftentimes shut down digestion, so we find that a little shocking to the system. And we would like you to remove, at least for the first two weeks of your cleanse, all fruit and fruit juices, with the exception of something that many of you are concerned about, which is our cran water. Now, the cran water is a formula. It's a signature formula that I developed for my fat flush cleanse, but it also has very potent anti-parasitic qualities because of the four very important organic acids. So between meals, you can most definitely 100% include the cran water. It will clean up all the gunk in your system. It will help you to eliminate because of the wonderful pH balance. And it is very specific for parasitic ailments because cranberries were used by Native Americans way back when to get rid of worms. The cran water formula includes one ounce of unsweetened cranberry juice, and that means unsweetened, no sweetener whatsoever, with seven ounces of water. You can take a glass of water up to eight times a day. So that's eight ounces of the cran water taken eight, eight times a day, so that's 64 ounces of the cran water. I think everything else is pretty clear. The antioxidant issue is because you're, you do not want to feed the parasites. You want to nourish yourself, but you want to make sure that you're starving the parasites. High doses of antioxidants, including vitamin C, I would never take more than 500 milligrams, only 400 I use of vitamin E, and I would not take a great deal of B12, even the methylated B12, because that will feed tapeworm. So all in all, when it comes to what you should be doing, is that there are many ways that you should avoid parasites. Number one, you should be filtering water at home or when traveling. The kind of filtration system should probably be one that includes a ceramic water filtration system that has a pore mesh filter that will block Cryptosporidium and Giardia.
You want to avoid salad bars because you never know how that salad bar was prepared and whether it was washed in contaminated water. And of course, you can't be eating raw, rare, undercooked meat and fish. And do not use microwave cooking as the primary method of cooking. We have seen all types of cases where people got very ill from fish, much more so than meat, believe it or not. Much of this is just common sense. You're going to wash your hands after you're handling your pets or after changing diapers. You'll cook with as many parasite-killing elements as possible. The garlic, the fennel, sage is another one which we could include up there as well as cloves. And I think it's important to cleanse annually or biannually for prevention. I like to see people do a cleanse after an exotic trip, perhaps overseas. I'd like to see people do this after the holidays when we've indulged with too much sugar because parasites love sugar. That's the favorite, favorite food of all. Now, years ago, I used to recommend a Clorox formula, which may sound very strange to many of you these days. But it was the one formula where we used about a quarter teaspoon of Clorox. I'm talking about Clorox bleach, which was put into about a gallon of water. And I soaked all my fruits, my vegetables, my meat, my eggs, because oftentimes they can be contaminated by what goes on you know, with the little hens. Uh, and I did this for many years until they changed the formula of Clorox. So I consulted with a biochemist who gave me a new formula to purify produce. And in one quart of water, we will now add 18 drops of a grapefruit seed extract with four ounces of a 3% hydro hydrogen peroxide, one that you can buy you know, in the regular drugstore, and about a teaspoon of baking soda. You blend and you soak all your produce for at least 15 minutes. Then you rinse well at least three times a day, and you can make this little formula fresh daily. So there are ways that we can all detoxify very easily and very safely in terms of parasites. So as a means of review, let me then just give you all the important ways that you can protect yourself against parasites. The resources are annlouise.com. You can find me on facebook.com. The products and testing are available through the distributor that I have worked with for over 20 years. I am a spokesperson for unikeyhealth.com in terms of full disclosure. I'd like you to know that. I've worked with this company for 20 years, and they promote many of the formulas that I have developed, as well as the CEO, James William Templeton. Now, for all of you that are involved on this webinar, we are now offering a 20% discount with the code PARA20 at checkout for the Parasite Cleansing Kit. And apparently, this offer, according to the good folks at Unikey, is going to expire on May 31st of this year. My gosh, that's a great offer and is not valid with other offers. So when it comes to parasites, it's all up to you. <clears throat> Your doctor, not even functional medicine doctors in this day and time, know what to look for. You can find parasites in terms of looking for a blood test. You can find blood tests which may or may not show a high monocyte level, a low white blood cell, or even some eosinophils that are raised. But very oftentimes, if you have a very exhausted immune system, you're not going to be seeing the typical signs of parasitic invasion that we used to see 10 to 20 years ago. So most importantly, it's to really understand how important your diet is, how important your lifestyle habits are, and to keep your intestinal tract as sweet as possible with the proper digestive enzymes, the elimination of sugar, the elimination of processed carbohydrates, grains to some degree, as well as the importance of hydrochloric acid, which is probably one of the most important digestive ailment, ailments or elements that we know of because the, the hydrochloric acid has the ability to digest and to neutralize both parasites and bacteria when you're eating. And many of us in this day and age, because of all the problems that we are finding with regard to lack of sodium in the diet, lack of iodine, and lack of zinc, are simply not 
producing enough HCL. And if you had the ability <clears throat> to do a test, which is known as the Heidelberg test, you would find that 8 out of 10 of you probably have low or virtually no hydrochloric acid that you are producing. And that 8 out of 10 statistic is very close to the statistic that was given to me over 20 years ago by well-known parasitologists in terms of the amount of people that are now suffering from parasites. So that if your stomach acidity is not up to par and you're not producing enough HCL, then you are certainly an open book in terms of parasites. And that is the reason that HCL is exceedingly important if you can tolerate it and there's no erosion in your system in terms of being a preventative as well as a cure. So having said that, uh, I know that we have a great many of you who have asked questions and so I'd like to ask Allie please if she could read me those questions. How disruptive is it to continue adding blueberries to my fat flow shake <coughs> in the mornings <clears throat> Excuse me. And at lunch, while in the first 15 days of the colon cleanse, how destructive is it? And disruptive? Well, less is more. Uh, all kinds of fruits can have the ability to feed candida as well as parasites if taken in high amounts. So, if you did a quarter cup of blueberries in your fat flow shake, I'd be perfectly fine with this. Another question that has come, what are, what are symptoms of tapeworm and can that include resistant weight gain? Can you explain the mechanism? Now this is a great question. The symptoms of tapeworm can be very, very, uh, can be very nonspecific, let me put it that way. Many individuals where we have found tapeworm using the antigen test from the lab will say that they feel fluish that they're very bloated, they have food allergies, a distended stomach which will not go back to normal. But the most important parasite to look for for resistant weight gain is roundworms. It's not tapeworm. Most individuals that are carrying tapeworm are in fact have resistant weight loss. They cannot lose weight. Most people that have resistant weight gain, in fact, are carrying lots and lots of roundworms. I can tell you stories from years and years ago of kids that were hospitalized because they couldn't gain weight and all we found in them were worms. So I think it's very important to understand that the inability to lose weight or gain weight can always be connected to parasites, even some of the microscopic ones that we're finding so prevalent in this day and age. Another question, since we have new information about good microbes and the need for them, I am wondering if you are still recommending giving foods a Clorox wash. Well, as I mentioned before, we now have the chemist formula. So I think that probably is, is a better idea. And what do you think of an ozone wash? Uh, I think that might be very helpful. I'm not familiar with the ozone washes, but I think that's probably a good question and one that we probably should take a look at. Could you comment on whether you think diatomaceous earth, bentonite clay, or activated charcoal do a sufficient job of cleaning the GI tract of parasites? So could you comment on whether you think diatomaceous earth, bentonite clay, or activated charcoal do a sufficient job of cleaning the GI tract of parasites? Well, another great question. I think if you're going to use anything, I would be using diatomaceous earth. I think one to two tablespoons in about eight ounces of liquid on a daily basis could not hurt you and it's been found to be very, very helpful in removing parasites. I love diatomaceous earth. Uh, bentonite clay I have never found to be helpful in terms of parasites, activated charcoal, very helpful for a majority of other toxins but not very specific for the parasite epidemic. Another question, what do you think of liver, the liver flush protocol? And this is of Hulda Clark or Andreas Moritz to rid the liver and gallbladder of stones and parasites. Okay, so what do you think of the liver flush protocol? to rid the liver and gallbladder of stones and parasites. Um, if, these, if these particular liver flushes include lots of uh, apple juice and, um, and or grapefruit juice as well as olive oil, 
it can be toxic to the gallbladder. You can actually have a stone that gets caught in the duct. So I'm not in favor of that at this point. And in terms of the parasites, I've never found it to be that helpful. I think it's important, however, to understand that the liver is always involved when there's a problem with parasites or worms, which is why the Verma Plus and the Parakey are the only protocols that I now recommend because I think that they're safe, they're rather benign. If the, prob if the protocol is too strong, you can always cut back, do the different elements every other day. I think that that just is the safest for people with very sensitive systems. Now, can you can you use the colon cleansing kit for children? Uh, can you use the colon cleansing kit for children? You certainly can. And we have very specific instructions on the colon cleansing kit. It's usually about half of the adult dosage. I don't think I would use the colon cleansing kit with very, very young children. Instead, what I would probably do with very, very young children is use that Zymex 2 that I told you about, which is very specific for the eggs or the larvae. And that is taken at two twice a day. It is an enzyme that is made with fison, which is an ingredient in figs found to be very, very antiparasitic, as well as uh, almond skins, very antiparasitic, interestingly enough. The problem in this day and age with eating a lot of almonds is that many of our almonds are gassed unless they're organic, in which case they're overheated. And that may not affect the antiparasitic qualities, Certainly, the gas almonds are something that we're not uh, really in favor of. So I, I like this particular product. It's a standard process product called Zymex 2. It's very mild, very helpful for young children. Um, those that are 10 and over perhaps could use the Parakeet and the Verma Plus, but again, at half the amounts. And then how long should you wait to retest? You know, I would wait at least two to three months to retest. I think that might be the proper time. Sometimes it takes longer to remove all the parasites from the system, depending upon how long you've been chronically or critically ill. Uh, probably every two to three months would be my, my best guess in terms of how long you should wait to, to retest. Another question is, can we use the Super GI, which is another product that Unikey has created, with a colon cleansing kit at the same time. Well, I'm going to tell you something about this product called the Super GI Cleanse. It, in and of itself, is a very mild anti-parasitic as well as cleansing product for the colon. Uh, it contains butternut, which is a very benign but very helpful herb in terms of getting rid of some of the larger invaders in your system. It is exceedingly helpful in getting rid of pinworms and threadworms as well as ascaris. Uh, that product also contains a certain amount of peppermint, which we find to be very helpful in terms of settling the GI tract and may in fact be very helpful as a tonic for amoeba. So we can definitely use the Super GI. You know, when I travel all around the country, as I've been doing these days, and you'll have to excuse my voice, I just came back from a long trip. <clears throat> But I find that the Super GI is exceedingly helpful in keeping my system flowing the way it should and keeping my system parasite free, et cetera, et cetera. And, and when I first uh, thought about any of these products which were developed by Unikey, I wanted the Unikey folks to develop a Super GI cleanse that would also act as an antiparasitic, a mild antiparasitic, whether somebody knew, knew or not that they may be carrying one or more invaders. So yeah, Super GI, and it may be the thing that a lot of you uh, also start with instead of the complete colon cleansing kit. Roundworm symptoms, roundworm symptoms, that's a great Roundworm symptoms are asthma, coughing that that you that where you've gotten you've gone to an ear, nose, and throat specialist, and they can't find anything wrong. A lot of times that's roundworms, so it's asthma. Problems with the adrenals very oftentimes are caused by roundworms. Um, milk sensitivity, particularly casein met sensitivity, can be a roundworm manifestation. Allergies, very specifically roundworm. Does Unity ship to Canada? Yes, indeed they do. 
can you wash fruits and veggies with white wine vinegar? Many years ago, my good friend, may he rest in peace, Dr. Herman Bueno was a big believer in using apple cider vinegar, not white wine vinegar, but apple cider vinegar. So you certainly can do so. I don't know the exact, um, the exact amounts of vinegar to use, but I remember him distinctly saying that he liked the use of the apple cider vinegar. Another question that has come in, if you've had a kidney transplant, can you do the colon cleanse? Ah, you know, um, that's a good question and you would have to check with your hopefully enlightened um, physician in terms of that where you go over all of the different ingredients and see if there's, God forbid, any contraindication in terms of what you may also be taking medicinally because that's a question that I wish I could answer but I can't. Why is crayon water safe for daily use? Uh, well, the question is why isn't it safe for daily use? Um, you're diluting cranberry juice and unless you have a distinct allergy to cranberry juice or you are taking very, very uh, medicinal blood thinners because cran water has a very mild blood thinning effect on some people, I don't think that there really is any contraindication. And where do you buy Zymex 2? You can buy it with Uniki, you can buy it online, it's a standard processed product. So uh, you might find a chiropractor or a naturopathic physician in your area that perhaps can buy that. Um, I think we have one more question here, if I'm not mistaken. Some of you have been asking for a repetition of these various protocols. What I'm going to say to you very briefly now is that it's a two-week program, basically. Days 1 through 15, you're going to be taking Vermikey, Parakeet and Verma Plus, and then you're going to rest for five days, which means that you still maintain the diet, but you're not taking these herbal supplements. You're going to give your system a rest, have your liver catch up with all the detoxification you do, and then you come back with another two weeks of doing the Verma plus the parakeet, you can at that point add the Zymex 2 if you'd like, which is going to get rid of any of the eggs that could be in the intestinal folds. It will also be helpful in terms of digesting larva. Um, in terms of the, the wash that you asked me about, all of that is going to be the chemist wash or the chemist formula that I got from a very good friend on YouTube, so you're just going to have to listen again for that. Uh, and we can also, I can post that. As a matter of fact, you know what I'm going to do? If you visit my Facebook page, and of course if you haven't visited it, we'd love to have you there, have you like the page. I'm going to have my trusted assistant who's been so helpful with all of this tonight, Allie, post the chemist formula tomorrow on the Facebook page. Um, full moon protocol. Okay, let me repeat that. This is the weirdest thing that I've said to you tonight, but this really works. I'm just, I'm here to tell you. The four days before the full moon, during the full moon, and four days after are always a good time to revisit the colon cleanse protocol. So even if you've done a full course of treatment, you may want to, just for that four day period, either four days before or four days after, take some additional parakeet and Verma Plus or Zymex 2 or a combination of all three, whatever suits you properly, so that you can make sure that your system has not been reinfected. It is so possible in this day and age, ladies and gentlemen, to become reinfected because parasites and worms are everywhere and our systems are not invincible fortresses the way they should be. Many of us are fighting toxic overload with heavy metals and fungus and mold. The system just cannot detoxify the way it used to. And we're lacking hydrochloric acid, which is the most important digestive enzyme, because there's not enough, as I mentioned to you before, zinc in our diets or iodine or salt. Or as we get older, we lose the ability to make hydrochloric acid or we're under a great deal of stress and we stop our systems from making all the hydrochloric acid. I'll take just a couple of more questions. And then the, I have another question here in reference to fruit. Is it 
is it 100% necessary to reduce all fruits? It's not 100% necessary. And so if you must reduce fruit or if you do not want to reduce all fruits, then you can take maybe a quarter cup of berries. I think that's probably the best. Has Unikey been tested for purity? Indeed it has, which is the reason that we have been delayed with some of our formulas. We cannot release anything unless they've been fermented for a certain period of time and unless all of our raw ingredients are tested by third-party labs for purity, for lack of um, for bacteria, as well as heavy metals. So I think you can feel very assured in getting your products from those companies. Should you stop all other supplements during the cleanse? Now that's the biggie. Should you stop all supplements during the cleanse? I would take only what is necessary because the idea here, and it only makes sense, is that you don't want to feed the critters. You want to starve them. That's why you want to be so pristine as much as possible with your diet. Only take what's absolutely necessary. Minerals would be fine. Uh, amino acids would be fine. Essential fatty acids, very important. Your GLA, your DHA, your EPA, those things are fine. But the ants antioxidants can feed parasites. So you want to reduce your vitamin C to 500 milligrams. Only take 400 IUs of vitamin E. And if you feel that you may be harboring a larger parasite, like your hookworms or your tapeworms, you want to reduce even your methylated B12. I know that's going to be um, hard for some of you, but that's the reality when you're trying to kill off the parasites. Take a low-level B vitamin because high levels of B complex can also feed parasites. And I think if you just understand that you're trying to, you're trying to starve the critters but support yourself, I think that would probably make the best sense. Last but not least, can you do the colon cleanse if you have IBS? What I would suggest if you have IBS is that this may be an instance where our particular test, which is a complete GI panel, will find out if you, in fact, are a candidate for this type of a program because we will check all of your inflammatory markers, all of your digestive markers, and give you a protocol that's very specifically related to your system so you are not harmed by the protocol itself. So with that in mind, I'd like to say adios, amigos, and thank you so very much for being with us this evening. We'll hopefully be seeing you at a, another venue that we have. Our next date, mark your calendars, is May 18th, and we will be in touch with you to let you know what that topic will be at that time.